This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. A recent Pew Research poll polled black adults, and 8 out of 10 said that blacks are treated less fairly than whites. Now, is that true across the country? Is it true at all? Is it true in segments of the country? With me is Bishop Kyle Searcy. He's the, he's the Bishop of Fresh Anointing uh, House of Worship in Montgomery, Alabama. Bishop, it's great, great to have you with us today. Bob, it's an honor. Thanks so much for having me. Had you, had you seen that Pew Research poll? No, I haven't. I didn't see that poll. It's my first time hearing of it. Yeah. Does that, does that uh, kind of qualify with, with your understanding of what you've seen? Well, you know, polls are perception. Um, actually, they're not necessarily scientific. They're perception. So eight out of 10 people perceive that that's happening. Uh, a lot of those that might have been polled may have had different experiences themselves. It's certainly not been my experience, but there is some kind of perception out there that African-American adults are being treated unfairly by those that are in authority. Now, you're the, you're the, the bishop of a, of a group of churches, actually, and in the, in the, the one in Montgomery is, what, 20, 2,400 people? Yeah, about 2,200 members. Now, is that, is, and, and you've been the pastor for how long? I've uh, been here about 28 years. Called, called, to, called by God out of college. That's correct. How yes, does, sir. How does a college, a college senior, been through everything that's in college today, hear and know the voice of God? You know, it's very interesting. My story's um, a bit unusual. Uh, nobody really witnessed to me or came up and shared Christ with me, but I was in college at the top of my game, so to speak. I, I had great grades. I was very popular. I was running the SGA. Everything a college student could want, I kind of had it. And things were going so well that it actually, in a way, opened me up for, uh, for the Lord to deal with me. It reminds me of the verse that says, the goodness of God leads us to repentance. And things were just so good, I just like, you know, there must really be a God. I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I didn't have that kind of background. But I walked in my dorm room one day, and, uh, I, you know, it's almost as if God was there waiting for me. I went through a two- or three-week season of just repenting and dealing with my lifestyle. And uh, one day I looked up and said, Jesus, you're real. I give you 100% of my life. And that's when my journey started. Well, what was your perception coming into a church like that? What was your perception of, of uh, justice between, between the races? You know, I uh, grew up in New York City. I went to an all-white school growing up. Um, I'll never forget a funny incident that happened to me where, as a very, very young boy, one of the teachers kept trying to put me on the bus, but my parents picked me up, and they just kept trying to put me on the bus. And uh, stories told, I don't remember it, but my parents and everybody laughs, laughed about it, but they, the story was told that I said, listen, I don't ride the bus just because I'm black. My parents picked me up. So somewhere in my mind growing up, there was still that mindset of, of disparity where certain people thought certain things about different races. But I, I didn't grow up uh, with those sunglasses on, so to speak. Again, all of my friends were white. I was in an all-white school. And uh, my, my upbringing was a little bit different when I moved to Montgomery, Alabama uh, as a young person around 11 or 12 years old, started in Tuskegee. Then I began to be more aware of certain uh, perceptions and certain experiences people had that were real, that were lodged in their psyche that actually affected uh, their way of seeing, seeing, seeing humanity and seeing the world. You think this, uh, that racial inequality that, that people perceive, so it's real in their life, is that pervasive through the United States? Is it, is it in the justice system? Is it just the treatment of police? Uh, how, how do you see it in Montgomery? You know, I, I have a little bit of a different view about all of that. I think that in some ways division is a fruit of fallen humanity. I've had a chance to travel all around the world uh, to many different parts of the world. And I, and, and I know that if we totally got rid of, of, of prejudice or prejudging someone, which is really what prejudice is, between black and white, then there, there's tribal prejudice in different parts of the world. There's dark skin, light skin prejudice in different parts of the world. So there's this part of fallen humanity, I think, that kind of bends toward division rather than unity. And I think it's an issue that uh, has been, and it's an issue that unfortunately will be. That's not that we accept it. It's not that we embrace it. Uh, but, I, but I do believe that, you know, that, that, that the fruit of fallen humanity just tends toward looking at things in somewhat of a different way. Well, do you think we, we, we can't fix it or we fix it through the criminal justice system or do we fix it through the human spirit? Well, 
Well, you have two different issues here. You have what's legal and then you have what's happening in the hearts of people. You can set laws that uh, pro prohibit discrimination, and I'm all for those laws. Anything that causes a person to, to be able to get away with mistreating somebody because you don't like them, because you prejudge them, because of your implicit biases, all of that is wrong, all of that's terrible. The law should protect every single human that's made in the image of God. That's one thing, but then there's another aspect of it that's the heart of an individual. You cannot legislate uh, issues of the heart. You can't force issues of the heart. So how people feel about someone is a total uh, different issue. That's where the gospel comes in. That's where the love of Christ comes in. That's where Jesus can do something in your heart that begins to change you. Uh, Ted Vail, a great friend of mine. Ted's a great friend. Years ago, Ted Vail was in Montgomery, Alabama. His wife worked with one of our members. They, invite, they were invited to church often, but he could not come to the church because we are primarily African-American church. And his perception of African-American people was just, you know, totally different than reality. One day he finally took enough courage to go to a small group. From the small group, he walked in church one day after years of being fearful, sat in the very back pew, I'll never forget it. And I saw Ted back there when he came in, he looked, you know, just, uh, just drained of, of blood almost, just frightened to death. And one of our little kids walked up to him, and Ted is a, a big guy, and just grabbed his stomach and picked it up and looked under it and opened his mouth and stuck his hands in his mouth. And, uh, and a thought comes to his mind. He said, wow, this guy couldn't stick his hand in my mouth unless he's my brother. Then little Khalil went and got on his mother's lap. His mother picked him up and wrapped her arms around him. And he gave the testimony and said, you know what? I didn't even know black ladies loved their kids. I had no idea. So he began to look at all that happened and God wrecked his heart. Uh, he, he became free of so much hatred and uh, issues that were in his life in our church. And he's one of my greatest friends to this day. He wrote a book and the book has a very interesting title. Uh, and it says my in that N word that nobody wants to say is my brother. Uh, hardly anybody published it, but I, I watched somebody who just didn't understand, who didn't have enough relationships with people to know that people really are people. There are different cultures, Bob. There are different ways that people grow up. There are different uh, values that people hold, but people are really people. We all bleed the same. We all have the same interests. We want to be loved. Uh, we we want to be liked. We want to be valued. And I think once people begin to learn that and understand that, their heart can begin to shift, and Jesus is a great way to cause that to happen. And this is this can be generational and it's gone on I mean, in the United States. It's gone on since the, the inception of the country. And it is it's carried on in a lot of cases, the, the racism. You, do you have hope that uh, that a lot of this can be can be healed? I do have hope. I have hope that it can be healed again. I believe the primary way is the gospel. Uh, I believe that Jesus touching the hearts of people. Are people loving? Are people forming relationships? Are getting out of fear so that you can bridge those aisles and form relationships with people that are different than you are? I think all of those things are optimistic. I'm not optimistic that it will be cured on this side of heaven. I'm not optimistic that every heart's going to be changed uh, on this side of heaven, but I am optimistic that we can deal with the legal inequalities. I am optimistic that we can have more justice. I am optimistic that even the, the hearts of individuals can be shifted. Uh, absolutely, I, I have a great deal of optimism, optimism about that. Well, you've got, you've got firsthand involvement in, in talking about the, the legal in, inequalities. When we talk about the First Step Act, you were very involved in that and very instrumental in, in, in getting that passed. Tell us about that. Well, I was invited to, uh, uh, to dialogue with the president about the First Step Act, and there were about 22 pastors who were asked to come to the White House to begin to dialogue about things that could be done in criminal justice reform. Uh, following that meeting, there were different conference calls. Um, a, a friend of mine, a great friend of mine, was one of the people who had an initial conversation with Jared Kushner that brought up the idea of how easy it could be to fix the criminal justice issue. And I was just honored to be at the table, and uh, we got behind the legislation from a private sector. Uh, there was a lot that was done in Congress. It's one of the few bills that were passed that had bipartisan support. And right now there are thousands of people who did not need to be in prison, who had unjust sentences thrown at them at a time when the thinking was different that are now free. One of them, the very first lady who was released is in Mobile, Alabama, not far from me. And uh, Jared Kushner made a call to Walmart, got her a job. Uh, I, with two other churches, got together. We bought her her first car and she is enjoying life, reunited with her daughter because justice was served. Uh, and that first step back was a great first step 
and reforming the criminal justice system. We're so excited about it. It is exciting. Thank you for your involvement there. Uh, we've got to get you back again, Bishop. Thank you so much for being with us today. Oh, you're welcome. My honor, sir. You don't have to look far to find people who seem to find contradictions in the way some Christians respond to our political climate today. Well, here at Viewpoint, we want to bring clarity to those issues. Steve Light's an executive in a Fortune 100 company who's pursuing his calling to be a pastor. I wanted to ask him about an email we found online from a person who has a lot to say about how Christians are mixing Bible with politics. This letter, uh, it, it really does. It's, it was on Facebook. Our producer, John, uh, John Ando, found it on Facebook. It's probably written by somebody who's very disgruntled. It says they, and they, they know the, the word because they're talking about 1 Samuel 15, 3, where mm -hmm. God tells the nation of Israel, go into the Amalekites, destroy everything, just including the babies, the sheep, everything. They didn't follow God's, they, they destroyed everything except the, the things they wanted to keep. Yeah. But then uh, he goes on to say, he says, the, these same Christians then talk about uh, the sanctity of life, and I would listen to these same Christians support the death penalty wars, military campaigns full of bloodshed, and all of these kind of things. And then uh, he said, then I realized that the leadership of many modern evangelical churches have become more dedicated to winning political battles than they are to trying to understand a very mysterious God. This is a very disgruntled, I think, uh, at one time, maybe a believer, but very disgruntled about uh, the God of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Nobody's ever explained to me how this God of vengeance squares with the love of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Have had, had you ever struggled with that, that, that picture, that image, or, or was it something that, as you study the Word, it cleared up for you? Yeah, I love this topic, and I'll tell you, if we break it down, it's a simple question. Is the Yahweh of the Old Testament even in the same family yeah. as Jesus Christ of the New Testament? And I would argue absolutely, but it takes a closer reading of Scripture. Mm -hmm. But before we get there, Bob, I think we have to unpack what you're talking about. It's, 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 a, it's a faith, it's a convenient faith. People can decide that they want the vengeful God of the Old Testament that they perceive yep. or the loving, merciful God to fit to their political or social De depending agenda. Depending on my, my narrative at the time. And, and it's if a complete I'm, corruption yeah. of what Jesus called us to be. That's exactly right. So I think the first thing that if you're really being an authentic Christian, you will ask this, what are the biases and the motivations and the agenda that I'm bringing to any engagement or discussion in a personal relationship, a social situation, or political. And if we're really yeah. honest with ourselves, we'll recognize that more often than not, we're using God for our own ends and we're not being true to Scripture. So I've got to look at my narrative. I've got to look at my biases, my prejudices. That's and exactly say, right. How does this square with who God really is? Yeah. Now let's dig into that. You know, the, the first thing is, as often I've heard people talk about this, it is angry, vengeful mm -hmm. God. But when you do a close reading of the Old Testament, you're going to see a consistency where God talks about over and over and over two things, living righteously and doing justice. Doing justice. Does that sound a lot like Jesus, mm -hmm. right? Go into the world and do the right, right. thing and do justice. Yeah. Now let's understand what we mean. Well, yeah. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I was gonna say, God calls us that in Micah, Micah 6, 8. That's exactly I've right. I've told you, man, this is what I want of you. That's right. To walk, walk in justice, mercy, and, and love, your, love the Lord your God. Well, let's look at Isaiah yeah. 1, 7. He says, learn to do good, seek justice, and care for the needs of the people. Mm -hmm. So, so, let's so how do you score that with, yeah. with 1 Samuel then, where it says, go in and, and destroy the Amalekites? Yeah, I think the thing here you have to understand is quite often we want to take a line of scripture or a situation and apply it in a modern context. And what yeah. we have to do is understand the, the context of what was going mm -hmm. on, the cultural situation, the objectives of God, what God was doing. Let's think about this. I, I was thinking about this morning because I knew we were going to talk about this. Let's break down what, Je what God meant about living righteously and doing justice. Mm -hmm. um, in the living righteously, you don't see either Jesus or the Old Testament scripture say, teach other people how to live righteously, watch other people, make sure they're living righteously. And it call says, them on it. Right, and call them on yeah. it perfectly. It's saying you seek to transform in your relationship with God and live the way God's called you to. And then the second piece of it is about justice. We get this mistaken sense of what we think of as uh, Western justice, that my rights yeah. have been offended, somebody has done wrong to me, I need to go into court and get reparations or get resolution. And it's a very inward selfish justice. That's not what the Old Testament talks about. It talks about, God says over and over, defend the rights of the widow, defend right. the rights of the childless or the orphan, mm -hmm. and defend the rights of the foreigner. 
Wow. It's about caring for other people. And it goes back to that idea of that self-sacrificing mm -hmm. love. God is always about taking care of other people. So real justice in scripture is not about wiping people out mm -hmm. when they're doing the wrong thing. It's about saying, let me love on people and help them to get to a better mm -hmm. place. You know, as, as, a, as a child growing up in the church, and I hear these stories myself, and, yeah. I, and I could understand Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm yeah. thinking, okay, these people are really, really bad people, yeah. and God destroyed them. God took them away, just like in the flood. You've yeah. gotten so bad, I got to start, kind of start over. But then with Samuel, in 1 Samuel, he's, he's at calling the nation of Israel, calling his people to warfare, calling yeah. them to destroy the Amalekites. Why would he do that, is the question. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting. What we have to realize is that we have a God who is holy. And <clears throat> God can't be around the profane. And God can't be around the unclean. And our natural state yeah. as humans is to be both profane because of our sin, and unclean, we're not living righteous. So the beauty of yeah. this, when Jesus went to the cross and we're covered in the blood of Jesus, mm -hmm. we are made holy, holy, not by our works, but by our faith in mm -hmm. Christ. But we still have an obligation in the relationship with the Father to be clean. And so how do we do that? We have to create an environment where we're being clean. And as he was taking the Jews into the promised land, and as he was guiding the nation of Israel, he tried to keep reminding them, our relationship will be broken because of your uncleanness, if you don't follow the life that I've laid out for you. And that corruption came from intermarriage, new faiths being introduced, things of the world that so often, even our modern world, separate us from the relation of God. That's the key to this. God is not a God of setting a bunch of laws and rules. God's saying, I wanna have a meaningful, deep relationship with you. And if you will try to live in this way, wow, it'll be amazing the way we can connect. And, and people can square that with, with Jesus and with, with, with what's happened in the New Testament. Yeah. How do they get around uh, the, the whole cultural thing right now? I mean, this, this guy is, is, is using this as an excuse, in this yeah. letter, is using this as an excuse to walk away from Christianity. I'd love to have a conversation with yeah. this individual. What would, what would you, how would you start I'd, ask, I'd start with a couple of questions. I'd start with the first question, and that would be, uh, <laughs> let me ask you this, are you following Jesus Christ or are you following a bunch of people in a church, right? Because mm -hmm. it sounds like in that tone you've given up on your Christianity. The second thing is, is, boy, imagine what the world would have been like if we had Paul in the church in Jerusalem with Peter and the apostles, and he didn't like what they were doing, and he just decided to walk, walk away from away ministry, from, yeah. walk away from being a Christian, walk away from helping build the kingdom. What would have happened in the path? Now, clearly God would have still brought Christianity yeah, right. to the world, but he would have missed his calling. Um, and then the third thing is I'll go right back to scripture. So let's look at Jesus' engagement with two of our most important apostles. How many times did he tell Peter that he needs to forgive people? 70 times seven. Which it means in perfection. It, it, it means perfection, it means infinity. Yeah. Because we're called to forgive people the way yeah. God forgives us. Mm -hmm. Boy, help us big time if God ever decides to, to not yeah. keep forgiving us. And the second thing is, is that what did, Peter, or what did James teach us, right? Let's look at James. Boy, you wanna really know how to be a Christian? Spend time in the book of James. Who is, who is James? He's the physical brother of Jesus. Jesus. Mm -hmm. Through Jesus' entire ministry, he rejects Jesus. He's not the Son of God, he's not the mm -hmm. Messiah. It's only after Jesus is raised from the dead by the Father that he's converted. And he's converted so powerfully that he becomes the first bishop of the Church of Jerusalem mm -hmm. and he dies nice. a martyr's death mm -hmm. for his faith. Now what's the point in that? Because in James 2.3, he says this, mercy trumps judgment. Wow. And the last scripture mm -hmm. I would say is, let's take a look. We like to tout John 3.16. Sure. We right? Everybody knows yeah. John 3.16, mm -hmm. every football game. See, football game, yeah. Set the sun so that we will be saved. But it's, I think in these day and time, we have to spend more time in John 3.17, which says that the Son of Man was not sent by the Father to condemn the world, but to save the world. Mm -hmm. So I ask you, if Jesus came not to condemn but to save, where do we get the right yeah. as Christians to go out finger pointing and want to mm -hmm. condemn the world? both in our own house and the wider world. It's about walking in love, mm -hmm. it's about caring for people, and it's about being gracious. And if we could do more of that, it'd be unbelievable the impact we could yeah. make in this country and this world. Yeah. If this writer would have seen more than that, he probably would have written a letter. Amen. Yeah. We, we, we do see a lot of injustice at times. We do see a lot of criticism. We see a lot of hardness in, our, in ourselves yeah. uh, as a church. And I don't want to just generalize the church, but we do see that and we got to repent of that. But if this, if this, uh, this writer would have seen more of the, the mercy, yeah. uh, 
he probably would have written a letter. Well, I'll bring it home for you. Uh, this, it, I think it starts at home. It, it really yeah. starts at home. I've got a 12-year-old son I'm raising right now, and he's a typical boy. He's doing all the wrong <laughs> yeah. things most of the time, but I love him to death. And on those days that I just want to lose my cool, mm -hmm. I have to go to Papa. I go to the Father and I say, remind me of how much you love me yeah. and how much you forgive me and how gracious you are and give me that same spirit with him. And when I go there, it changes. It's that fruit of the spirit where there's peace. Sure. And so I would encourage Christians that whether they're dealing with um, animosity in the church or challenges or they're dealing with political or social issues in their community, mm -hmm. start in prayer, get your heart prepared with the spirit. So when you engage people, you can be a light of the world that attracts wow. people. Yeah. It says there's something different. I want to know who you follow. As always, we welcome your comments on our Facebook page. You know, the role of women continues to be a topic in our culture today. One woman in the Chicago area used to call herself a biblical feminist back in the 70s and has written some books to show how women of the Bible were a lot tougher than we realized. Growing up in the 70s, you, you'd mentioned that, you know, I don't know if it's really a term of biblical feminism, but you, you were influenced and you, you kind of intrigued by the feminist movement at that time. Oh, absolutely. So I was uh, yeah, born in 1972 and so sort of right in the heart of, you know, a lot of this mm -hmm. women's liberation movement. And just growing up in the late, you know, by the time I got to school in the late 70s and then early 80s, I was really drawn to these women who were really, um, you know, establishing themselves in careers and kind of leading this charge of that women can do and be anything. Yeah. And yeah. as a young girl, um, that just really made a really powerful mark on me. But to me, it was just, again, growing up and, and growing in Jesus and, and reading the Bible as a young girl and, and sort of, and then seeing what some of the women were able to do in the world, it just became this sort of cemented calling in my own life that, yeah, God, God intends great things for men and women. Yeah, and, and to kind of knowing you, you're your own, your own per person. Nobody else has to make those decisions for you about yep. what you're going to do, what you're going to be, who you're going to yep. relate to. Uh, do you see that happening in the church more often today than it did back in the, say, the 50s, 60s, 70s? I think so, and I hope so. You know, certainly not in all churches. But I see, I mean, it is a beautiful thing for me, like as a mom raising my kids, where they have this just wide understanding of what people can be and do, mm -hmm. you know, no matter what, um, you know, no, what their gender. And, and it really is kind of a lovely, a lovely thing, particularly for women growing up in the church. Cause certainly, you know, when I was a girl in the church growing up, there weren't many women pastors back mm -hmm. then, you know, so there were still, there was still some, some room to grow that, that I didn't grow up seeing. Is, is that, uh, you, you think that, that early beginning there is, is one of the reasons uh, for, for your books, Grit and Grace and Gritty and Graceful? That, I, think, uh, I mean, they really do say that women in the Bible uh, were as important as the men in the Bible, and we don't tell the stories the same way sometimes, mm -hmm. and yet uh, they're very, very powerful characters. I think it was, certainly. Um, so I, I don't remember where I tell this story. Maybe I wrote it somewhere separately. Um, but when I was little, two of my favorite books, I had, I had these little square Bible books and I remember reading a couple of them, which were about women of the Bible. And I was so intrigued. I think it was, one was Hannah and one was maybe Naomi's story. Um, because I feel like I didn't hear a lot about those. So part of me in wanting to write these books was just wanting to make sure that there were, um, that there were books out there that parents could share with their sons and daughters. Like, Hey, God has always been about using women in, in God's story. So yeah. what are what are your favorites? I love oh so I love Esther. I love Deborah. I love that story so much. Um, moving into the because New she was Testament, a warrior or I think so. Yeah. She's so interesting and a poet. You know, mm -hmm. I, I I actually love David for the same reasons. You know, you have this warrior poet. It's like what an interesting combination that we don't normally think of. Um, in the New Testament, I mean, I love the story of the Samaritan woman. Uh, the woman at the well is just a remarkable mm -hmm. story on so many levels. It tells us so much about Jesus. Um, and Mary Magdalene, I mean, I just can't. That My all-time, hands-down favorite moment in, scri in Scripture is when Jesus simply calls Mary's name, when he just says, Mary. I think it is, you know, when, when we read that story on Easter, it makes me get all choked yeah. up. Just to speak to that friendship that Jesus it had. What, what kind of response are you getting from, say, preteen girls who really are coming into that stage of their life where they're, they're making some decisions about who they want to be and what they want to be? And There was a girl I was talking to, and she was telling me how much she loved Grit and Grace. And I said, oh, what's your favorite story? And she goes, oh, I love Queen Esther. And she said, 
because she was so brave. brave. And yeah. I was like, oh, she didn't even say that she was beautiful. <laughs> yes. And it was Esther's beauty is very important. So don't get me wrong. But it was just it was a great moment. I thought I was like, yes. yes. How do we how do we explain that to our kids? today? I mean, as they're growing up, the 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 internals when we're talking about the difference. I mean, the, the with, with men and women and mm -hmm. girls can do anything without mm -hmm. uh, changing God's purpose in their life. I guess that, that, that today's what would you say to, I guess, a modern feminist today? A girl who's growing up that way. Would you, how would you explain God to her and, and, the, and, and the stories in the Bible? Oh, that's a, that's a big question. Yeah. It's sort of similar in a way toward, you know, when people think like faith and science are at odds. Yeah. I kind of see like faith and faith and feminism. And again, just in the most generic. Kind right. Of I understand that. Other, um, are not at odds. God has God is for women. And it, it, Jesus, my goodness, was certainly yeah. for women and a liberator of women. Mm -hmm. Now it's confusing because we go back in the Old Testament and you read all these laws and you know, even now I read through them and I'm like, really God, why did you make it so difficult? Yeah. But then part of it we'll just never understand fully. And yet when you read it through this perspective of God has been for women, try to understand what might have been going on here. Mm -hmm. Could these have been protections that actually existed in a in a patriarchal world that wasn't God's design? Yes. You know, there's all sorts of things, but but that God is for women. These these were very, very brave women given the culture they lived in. Oh, absolutely. And I think, you know, for me, one of the, the bigger things, something like polygamy in the Old Testament, very hard to understand. Why wouldn't God have just said, nope, bad, you know, yeah. you know, the way we understand it today. And I remember talking to somebody years ago and they said, well, you have to understand again in that culture where women had no, without a husband, she had no protection. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the idea of polygamy existing at that time, and again, I'm not supporting polygamy, was a, it was a protection, you yeah. know, it yeah. was a way and like, okay, then that helps you understand kind of the mindset that it doesn't just seem so random and sexist or something. Yeah. Well, I love, I love the way you've dealt with some of the tough ones like Hagar and Ishmael. Mm -hmm. you've, you've dealt with some really tough stories and you've done it in a, in a beautiful way. At the same time, uh, an encouraging way for, for young girls. But the books are Grit and Grace and Gritty and Graceful. And where can they pick those up for their, for their children? So these books are available anywhere. Um, you're, you know, anywhere your books are sold. Your favorite local bookstore is always a great place. If they don't have them, you can always um, request that they get a copy for you, and they'll be happy to order it. Otherwise, they are available at online retailers as well or direct from the publisher beaming books well i know some of the things you've said have probably piqued the interest of a lot of people out there that might want to hear you speak some more on some of these ideas so where can get in touch with you if they want you for, as a speaker or maybe as a reader in a bookstore sure well you can uh, visit my website which is karen yeah. um, otherwise i'm on uh, social media and you can reach out to me via facebook or twitter any of those places too. well thank you so much we appreciate you being here all right thank you this is where, on other programs, you'd be watching a commercial, but not on Viewpoint. If you've never supported TV44 before and enjoy Bob's interviews on Viewpoint, we encourage you to please support us today. Go to WTLW.com and click Donate. You can find out more about today's guest on our website. And I want to let you know there are two great ways to help spread the word about the show. One, we'd appreciate your financial support as Viewpoint has no advertising. It's supported by you. The second, log on to YouTube and find our Viewpoint interviews and like, subscribe, and share with your friends. The more people who like our YouTube videos, the better chance our gospel message can rise to the top of search engines and help others learn about the truth of the Bible. Thanks for joining us today. Remember, you can share all the Viewpoint interviews you've seen today online at YouTube. And you can listen to the Viewpoint Podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and anywhere you can listen to a podcast. <laughs>